Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind address the theme, Crossing New Frontiers to Conquer Today's Challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be here on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'm Philip Emagwale. A breakthrough in computational mathematics or in the supercomputer solution of a grand challenge problem is particularly worthy of being a benchmark in the history of the computer. That breakthrough is not worthy if it changed the way we looked at the computer and the internet. With the supercomputer that communicates across processors and does so synchronously and computes within processors and does so simultaneously, we now have answers to previously unanswerable grand challenge questions. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. Calculus and algebra are the languages that I use to describe grand challenge problems arising in science and technology. Mathematics is as old as civilization. Mathematical knowledge is abstract and immutable. Where did human knowledge of mathematics come from? New mathematics came from the minds of research mathematicians working at the farthest frontiers of mathematical knowledge. New mathematics came from equations that we are previous that we are unseen before. New mathematics occurs when we understand how to solve the toughest problems arising in mathematics and how to solve a problem that could not be solved before. The new computing paradigm for which I was known but not known well was an automatically programmed and email communicated messages that I sent to and received from equidistant processors that were across the surface of a globe. In my new supercomputing paradigm that represents a new way of counting, the toughest problems arising in science and engineering and mathematics could be chopped up into one billion smaller problems that could be solved in a one problem to one processor corresponded manner and solved one billion times faster than was previously possible. My new paradigm in supercomputing was the diametrical opposite of what I learned as a 19 year old when I began programming supercomputers back on June 20, 1974 at and at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. In that, compute, in that old paradigm of large-scale computational mathematics, I programmed one isolated processor to take what seemed to be forever to solve one grand challenge problem of mathematics and physics. My contributions to mathematical physics and computational mathematics 
came from the bowels of my new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 processors that became a virtual supercomputer. I was asked, who invented mathematics? Mathematics is a living body of human knowledge whose pieces were invented by research mathematicians whose names were quite often lost in the midst of time. The contributions of Philip M. Aguale to mathematics is this. I contributed nine partial differential equations to the branch of mathematics called calculus. My contributions to mathematical knowledge also includes these equations. I contributed nine partial difference equations to the branch of mathematics called extreme scale algebra. My contributions to mathematics include this. I invented how to solve those finite difference algebraic equations and how to solve them by parallel supercomputing them across an ensemble of millions of processors. My contribution to mathematics also include this. The mathematical knowledge of how to solve the grand challenge problems arising in science and technology. Back in the 1980s, the US government publicized a list of 20 grand challenge problems of computational mathematics. Those interdisciplinary problems we are at the crossroad where mathematics, science, and computer science met. Those mathematical problems we are called grand challenges because no mathematician could solve any of them. I was the first computational mathematician to discover how to solve the grand challenge problems and to discover how to solve them across my new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that is a virtual supercomputer. What new mathematical knowledge did Philip Emma Aguale contribute to mathematics. My contribution to extreme scale computational mathematics is abstract and cannot be understood by a high school math teacher. The reason is that new mathematical knowledge are discovered at the frontiers of knowledge and to reach that frontier in turn requires three decades of training in the mathematical sciences. It took me 30 years from learning the times table to learning the partial differential equations of mathematical physics to arrive at the frontier of massively parallel supercomputer super computer knowledge we are new partial differential equations of calculus and new partial difference equations of algebra can be discovered. The greatest mathematicians are famous for their contributions that increased our body of mathematical knowledge. The contribution of Philip Emma Aguale to mathematics is this. I discovered how to solve the toughest problems arising in computational mathematics. 
Back in 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered how to solve such grand challenge problems and solve them across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 processors that we are identical to each other and that shared nothing between each other. Each processor was akin to a tiny computer that operated its own operating system. My contributions to mathematics was the cover story of the May 1990 issue of Siam News. The Siam News is written by research mathematicians and written for research mathematicians. Siam is the acronym for the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Siam is a 14,000 member society of applied and computational mathematicians. My image and representations of my contributions to mathematics have been reprinted in high school mathematics textbooks and in school reports on inventors. Back on July 8, 1991, in the nation's capital, Washington, District of Columbia, I delivered an invited lecture of my contributions to mathematics. I delivered that lecture at the largest international congress of mathematicians called ICM 91. That congress is the Olympics of the world of mathematics and is held once every four years. The research lecture that I delivered on my new discovery of how to message pass initial boundary value problems and that I delivered at that mathematics congress was over the heads of the attendees. That research lecture was on my new parallel processed way of solving a system of partial differential equations and solving them across a new internet that is a new global network of processors. As an aside, the partial differential equations on my green board photo that was dated May 9, 1996, and that was widely reprinted as a sidebar in high school mathematics textbooks and in school reports, we are formulated for multi-dimensional and multi-phase flows of crude oil, natural gas, and injected water that were flowing one mile deep below the surface of the earth and flowing across a production oil field that is the size of a town. The stability analysis of the numerical discretizations of those system of partial differential equations is a grand challenge in all of algebra because the direct stability analysis on the nonlinear system of partial difference equations with variable coefficients was impossible. I did what any research computational mathematician must do. Namely, I investigated the theorized stability condition of a simplified version of the original initial boundary value problem. In the early 1980s, and as a research mathematician in College Park, Maryland, United States, I conducted extensive experimental stability investigations on the actual initial boundary value problem that must be parallel processed and solved to pinpoint with greater accuracy the deposits of crude oil and natural gas. From the perspective of the mathematician, climate modeling is 
an initial boundary value problem of calculus that must be discretized and reduced to a large scale problem in algebra that is the discrete counterpart that is defined at finite points in space and time and that approximated the original mathematical problem that was defined at infinite points and therefore will take forever to solve exactly. Back in the 1980s, the extreme scale computational mathematician did not know how to parallel process the extreme scale climate model and did not know how to chop that grand challenge problem into a million smaller problems and did not know how to parallel process that ensemble of problems and do so with a one-to-one -one problem to process the correspondence and do so across an ensemble of a million processors that were tightly coupled to each other. The contributions of Philip Emma Aguale to mathematics is this. I discovered how to parallel process that grand challenge problem and do so across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 processors that were tightly coupled to each other and that shared nothing between each other. I was asked, why should the African student study mathematics? Mathematics is more than memorizing the time table of arithmetic. Mathematics is more than learning how to solve the quadratic equation of algebra. The African student must study mathematics because it's a subject that nurtures critical thinking. Critical thinking, in turn, is the most undervalued experience in education. This lack of critical thinking skill explains why a 13-year-old Northern Nigerian that did not learn geometry proofs is easily convinced by Boko Haram jihadists to strap herself with a suicide bomb. To dig deeper into the quadratic equation of algebra and to be reflective of how the partial differential equation of calculus enables Nigeria to discover and recover otherwise unforeseeable crude oil and natural gas demands a significant time for reflection and thought. My passion for performing the fastest calculations began in early 1964. I was then a nine-year-old in Abo, Midwest region, Nigeria. Each late afternoon, I practiced solving 60 to 100 arithmetical problems and solving them within 60 minutes. I was practicing for the all-important 1965 Common Entrance Examination into King's College, Lagos, Nigeria. At that time, King's College was the most elite secondary school in Nigeria. The entrance examination into Nigerian secondary schools was akin to American scholastic aptitude test that was at the level of a 12-year-old. That entrance examination consisted of two parts, a set of 60 questions on the English language and another set of 60 problems on arithmetic. Each problem must be solved within 60 minutes. For the 20 month onward of January 1964, and in the late afternoons, and in the evening, and in the living room of our three bedroom house, my father drilled me with 60 increasingly challenging arithmetic problems. I used a stop clock that stops at the 60th minute. 
with daily practice for the forthcoming entrance examination, the questions on mathematics became easier than those on the English language. At the All Nigeria Federal Entrance Examination, I selected the Faraway All Boys Boarding School, King's College, Lagos, as my first choice. I was confident that I scored 100% in the mathematics portion of that entrance examination because I had been rehearsing for that entrance examination and practicing it almost daily for nearly two years. I was able to finish the 60 minute test in 10 minutes. At the practice sessions, I only scored above about 90% in the English language portion of that entrance examination. So my total score of 190 was not high enough to get me an admission into the very competitive King's College, Lagos, Nigeria. My failure in 1965 to get into the most sought after secondary school in Nigeria was a big blow to my father's ego and to mine. At age 10, my confidence in my mathematical ability was supreme. That confidence stayed with me and I was not afraid to tackle previously unsolved mathematical problems such as solving initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics and solving them for the first time and across a new internet that is a new global network of processors each akin to a tiny computer that we are identical to each other and that shared nothing between each other and that we are tightly coupled to each other i was confident because I was identified as very talented in mathematics and as, as someone that will shine in the field of mathematics. Back in early 1965, at age 10, at St. John's Primary School, Boji Boji, Abo, Midwest Region, Nigeria, my school headmaster, Mr. Okwechime, would not have been surprised if he was told that a quarter of a century later, that I will be the cover story of the top mathematics publication, namely the May 1990 issue of the Siam News that is published as the, as the news journal of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. Why must the inventor of the modern supercomputer that computes in parallel also be a research mathematician? The reason is that the research mathematician is taxed to figure out how to reduce her mathematical fiction to our physical fact. Parallel Processing was first published as science fiction back on February 1, 1922. 67 years later, on July 4, 1989, that science fiction became non-fiction and that discovery of practical parallel processing changed the way we look at the computer and the supercomputer. It's a misconception that my research in parallel processed computational mathematics was graspable to the most brilliant mathematicians in the world. Nothing could be further from the truth. To prove my point, a billion and a half persons use or share their knowledge across 10 billion videos posted on YouTube. At least a million of those videos were produced as scientific lectures with at least a thousand of those videos delivered by the top research mathematicians in the world. Yet, you will not find any video in YouTube other than mine, of course, in which a mathematician described the partial differential equations that he or she invented and described how he or she 
serve them across a new internet that is a new global network of processors. Back in 1989, it made the news headlines that an African supercomputer wizard in the United States had won the top prize in the field of supercomputing and won that prize for solving the grand challenge problem of supercomputing and for solving that problem across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 tightly coupled processors and won that prize for solving the grand challenge problem of mathematical physics and for solving it at the world's fastest speed. I am that Nigerian. I am that Nigerian supercomputer scientist that was in the news back in 1989. As a supercomputer scientist, I had to quantify my parallel process solution to the grand challenge problem as well as measure the new speeds of the physical experiments that I conducted across my new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 processors that were identical to each other and that were tightly coupled to each other and that were equal distances apart from each other. Without mathematical knowledge, supercomputing across millions of processors would be an unconstrained speculative science fiction. Mathematics is to science what paint is to art, or what words are to literature. The secret to my success as a supercomputer scientist was that my father, Nemeka James Emagwale, attended Christ King College on Icha, Nigeria, and attended that high school for the six years inclusive of 1942 through 47. With that level of education, my father was able to tutor me from the times table to solving the quadratic equation of algebra. The Earth's atmosphere is a sewer for pouring carbon dioxide. Each year, 38.2 billion tons of carbon dioxide are spewed into the atmosphere. That's five tons, or the weight of an elephant of carbon dioxide emissions per person per year. 62 years ago, only 9.2 billion, billion tons of carbon dioxide were spewed into the Earth's atmosphere every year. The top three carbon polluting countries are China, United States, and India. If the Earth gets warmer by 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, some species will become extinct. Sea level will rise one and a half feet by the year 2100. And some small island nations could be destroyed with hundreds of millions of refugees becoming displaced. Parallel processing is the crown jewel of extreme scale computational physics. The parallel process solution of any grand challenge initial boundary value problem is at its mathematical core. It's at its mathematical core, a clarion call to solve the largest system of equations arising in algebra that in turn was derived as an approximation of a companion system of partial differential equations of calculus. Nine times 
out of 10. That algebraic grand challenge also underpins an extreme scaled computational fluid dynamics code that in turn contains the basic discovery of practical parallel processing that I made on the 4th of July 1989. In his White House speech of August 26, 2000, then U.S. President Bill Clinton described my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing as the Philip M. Aguale formula that enables computers to make fast calculations. My contributions to science stood out for one reason, namely, I worked alone. For that reason, I won the top prize in supercomputing alone and won it back in 1989 and at age 35. At that time, supercomputing was multidisciplinary. Supercomputing was a subject that drew heavily from mathematics, physics, and computer science. Therefore, it was typical for a team of 50 seasoned research scientists from different fields to cooperatively work together to solve a grand challenge initial boundary value problem of mathematical physics, such as developing the extreme scaled and the parallel processed general circulation model or the petroleum reservoir simulator. In a supercomputing research team, each scientist drew upon his or her disciplinary knowledge from his or her subspecialties within physics, mathematics, and computer science, and with the team integrating its scientific knowledge and its mathematical techniques from those subdisciplines. Some, some made the egregious mistake of comparing my contributions to the development of the supercomputer that won the top prize in supercomputing and did so back in 1989 to the contributions of a team of 50 supercomputer scientists that recently won the top prize in supercomputing. It's like comparing a 50-person relay race that covered a total distance of 50 miles to a one-person race that covered the same distance of 50 miles. But more importantly, the recent contributions of the team of 50 supercomputer scientists was to reconfirm for the millionth time my primordial discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989. Today, and in China, or United States, or Japan, or the European Union, a multidisciplinary team of 1,000 supercomputer scientists might be given a massively parallel supercomputer that costs up to $1.25 billion the fastest supercomputer in the world cost more than the spacecraft that took men to the moon and cost more than the budget of each of the 40 poorest nations in the world the fastest supercomputer in the world is knowledge intensive and for that reason cannot be within the confines of an academic of any academic institutions in part because the fastest supercomputer costs more than the annual budget of any institution of higher of higher education but more importantly the body of knowledge of parallel supercomputing is extraordinarily deep and too expansive to reside in its entirety within any single academic institution. When parallel processing meets the biggest questions in computational science, the impossible to solve becomes 
possible to solve. Parallel processing is the vital technology that enables us to ask the biggest questions and then find new answers to those previously unanswered questions. I began my quest for practical parallel supercomputing in the realm of science fiction, namely by imagining the one binary million email wires that I must use to ingest my data and do so from outside a new internet that is a new global network of commodity of the shelf processors. I began that quest by imagining how to move my data efficiently and move them inside my 64 binary thousand processors that were tightly coupled to each other and that shared nothing between each other. I also imagined my email messages as sent to and received from two raised to power 64 processors that I imagined as encircling a globe in 64 dimensional hyperspace. I discovered that our post-human descendants of year million will find it impossible to construct their parallel supercomputer that has one pros that has a one processor to one vertex correspondence with the two raised to power 64 vertices of the cube in 64 dimensional hyperspace. Today's grand challenge questions are more complex than ever. An example of a grand challenge problem is how to massively parallel process the extreme scale computational fluid dynamics codes that must be parallel executed when modeling the flow of blood through the human cardiovascular system. Parallel processing is an entirely new approach to modern computer science. Yet, there is a practical limit to the theoretically unlimited speed of the parallel supercomputer. Often, there is a limit to what seemed unlimited. A story about the origin of chess contains an important lesson on why the parallel supercomputer cannot be constructed with a processor to vertex correspondence with the hypercube in the 64th dimensional hyperspace. About 800 years ago, King Shiham of India loved to play games. Eventually, the king mastered and became bored with all the games known to games masters. The king invited Caesar ben Dahia, his grand vizier or prime minister, to his palace and commanded Caesar ben Dahia to invent the toughest game in the world. After a year of meditation and hard work, the grand vizier returned to the palace. Have you invented the toughest game in the world? The king asked his grand vizier. Yes, the grand vizier answered. I call it Chaturanga. That new game, Chaturanga, is the precursor of the modern chess, a game that beckons upon the most intelligent persons. Chaturanga is played on a game, on a game board that is comprised of eight rows and eight columns, or 64 black and white checkered squares. After playing Chaturanga, the king explained, this is the toughest game in the world. Name your reward for this invention. The Grand Vizier thought carefully and then said, 
my reward for inventing chaturanga is a pile of rice. Why don't you ask for gold instead of rice? The king wondered aloud. Gesturing to the 64 squares on his new chessboard, Chaturanga, the Grand Vizier asked for a grain of rice for the first square, two grains for the second, for the second, and four grains for the third. The king thought this was a silly request. Is that all? Seven grains. The king interrupted the Grand Vizier. No, the Grand Vizier continued. Each square got double what the last square got. All 64 squares get their grains of rice. Puzzled, the king protested. I have a greater reward. Take my daughter's hand in marriage. Your majesty, the vizier said, I'm a happily married man. Oh, how can I forget Mrs. Vizier? The the king commanded his aides to bring a spoonful of rice and fill all 64 squares of the new chessboard with each square allocated double what the previous square got. The servants started counting the grains of rice, one, two, four, and soon the first teaspoonful of rice was used up. Then four bags of rice were required. Then the king got pale as 1,024 bags of rice, then one binary billion, binary million bags of rice. We are gone at the 20th square. The amount of rice needed seemed infinite. The total grains of rice needed for all 64 squares was 2 raised to power 64 minus 1 or 18 quintillion grains of rice or about 18 followed by 18 zeros grains of rice. The total bags of rice the Grand Vizier demanded was equal to the total amount of rice that was ever harvested by all the rice farmers that had ever lived on planet Earth. That amount of rice will cover the earth many times over and has the mass of Mount Everest. I share this story from the 13th century India and did so to highlight the invincible limits to the sp speed of the future planetary size supercomputer. But I also use this story to explain to children why it's impossible to scrub off a picture that's gone viral on the internet. You share your picture with two Facebook friends, then share it with four friends, and when your picture has gone viral, you cannot scrub it out of the internet. I also share this story because I once speculated that supercomputer scientists of the 22nd century or further could parallel process across their internet that could be defined and outlined by two raised to power, power 64 commodity processors that had a one-to-one -one processor to vertex correspondence and had that relationship with the vertices of a cube that is tightly circumscribed by a globe in the 64th dimensional hyperspace. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. I'm known as the first massively parallel supercomputer scientist and as the first person to discover how a million processors can be fused together by as many email messages and fused together to form one whole cohesive unit that is a new computing machinery that is the world's fastest computer that made the news headlines back in 1989. 
the new supercomputer that is a new internet that I invented on July 4, 1989, is radically different from the constituent processors that it originated from. As an aside, and in my dictionary, the words computer and internet are like two sides of the same coin. I believe that the 22nd century supercomputer scientists cannot have an internet that is not also a parallel supercomputer or vice versa. The moral of my story of the origin of chess in the 13th century India and its lesson for the planetary sized supercomputer hopeful of the 22nd century was that at the beginning I was as I was as unaware as the king, but at the end, I became as knowledgeable as the Grand Vizier. At first, and back in early 1980s, I grossly underestimated the power of Dublin. I once thought that I could simultaneously program to raise to power 64 number of processors and synchronously send and receive email messages across a new internet that I visualized as a new global network of 64 times to raise to power 64 number of bidirectional email wires. A third important lesson of my story of the origin of chess in the 13th century India lies in the uncontrolled growth of the population of Nigeria, my country of birth. Nigeria is now the seventh most populous nation in the world. Nigeria is a little bigger than Texas, but could grow by mid 21st century to become the third most populous nation in the world. Last year, Nigeria welcomed 5.5 million newborns, or 40% more babies than the United States. This year, Nigeria will welcome more than the population of Libya, or Norway, or New Zealand. The planetary-sized vision that inspired my contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this. The earth is enshrouded by fluids, namely the atmosphere and the oceans, as well as the rivers and lakes, and also surrounded by subterranean fluids, such as crude oil, natural gas, and water. To invent a new internet that is a new supercomputer de facto, I visualize 65,000 536 processors as equal distances apart and within the fluids that enshroud the earth. I envisioned a globe in the 16th dimension that was encircled by two raised to power 16 or 65,536 commodity of the shell processors that were distributed equal distances apart from each other and that were tightly coupled to each other and that shared nothing between each other. I envisioned each processor as having its own operating system. I envisioned those 64 binary thousand processors as embedded within the fluid or atmospheres and oceans that enshroud the earth or globe. I envisioned that globe as tightly encircling a, globe, a cube with 16 times 2 raised to power 16 or 1,048,576 bidirectional edges. In the modern configuration of supercomputers and at one foot per email wire, those email wires will total 200 miles of cables. Each vertex on the surface of that globe was my metaphor for one processor. Each bidirectional edge on the surface of that globe was my metaphor for one email wire. That globe is my metaphor for the Earth. That new global network of 64 binary thousand processors 
is one of the two internets that I invented as two supercomputers and is the reason I was profiled in books such as the one titled History of the Internet. I envisioned each processor as simulating the motions of the nearest 3,000 square miles of fluids. I invented a new supercomputer that encircled the globe in the way the internet does and that could be used to solve never before solved problems in algebra. I invented two new supercomputers. My first supercomputer was constructively reduced to practice as an ensemble of processors that encircle the globe in the way the internet does. My second supercomputer was an actual reduction to practice of 65,536 processors that encircled the globe in the 16th dimension and did so in the way the internet does. That parallel supercomputer became super by computing faster than any scalar or vector supercomputer. That new supercomputer enables the computational mathematician and physicist to answer previously unanswerable questions arising in extreme scale algebra. Such questions are recurring decimals in the grand challenge problems of supercomputing. By definition, algebra is the generalization of arithmetic. In high school algebra, two letters represent two numbers. In the supercomputer algebra that arises from trying to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas, one trillion letters must represent one trillion numbers arising from a system of one trillion equations of algebra. Those one trillion equations are evenly distributed across one million processors that in turn solves them in parallel by computing one million calculations at once. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. The computer is the greatest invention since fire. The modern supercomputer is the greatest invention in modern physics. I believe that we are witnessing a technological change of tectonic proportion. Each generation redefined the word computer. Our descendants' definition of the computer will perhaps become synonymous and correspond to our phrase, planetary sized super brain that enshrouds our earth. In year million, I foresee each post-human person as a super intelligent cyborg that is part human, part machine, and part computer, and that has a great sense of humor. I foresee their super brains as enshrouding even the solar system and as one super being that can live forever. When parallel supercomputing meets the biggest questions in computational science, the impossible to solve becomes possible to solve. Parallel supercomputing is the vital technology that enables us to ask the biggest questions and then find new answers to those previously unanswered questions. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. Back on February 1, 1922, a science fiction story was published in the book titled Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. 
That science fiction story described how, in theory, 64,000 human computers could be employed and used to solve the partial differential equations that must be used to predict the weather for the whole Earth. Back on June 20, 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, United States, the day I began programming supercomputers, I set my mind on programming the fastest supercomputer. A decade later, my supercomputer hopeful became a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. On July 4, 1989, I figured out how to handcast the weather and do so one mile deep inside an oil field that is the size of a town. That massively parallel supercomputer that is a new internet de facto that I set my mind on ultimately became my signature invention that became the subject of school reports. My contribution to the development of the computer is this. I was the first person to figure out how to turn the science fiction of parallel processing across millions of processors into the non-fiction that is today's supercomputer that occupies the space of a soccer field. The reason I remember the date I discovered practical parallel processing was that it was the U.S. Independence Day. You cannot study to become the first parallel supercomputer scientist you can study to become an aerospace engineer, but you cannot study to become the first astronaut or to travel to the planet Mars. You become a pioneer astronaut by becoming the first person to travel to Mars. Similarly, you cannot study to become the first person to figure out how to harness practical parallel supercomputing and do so to solve real world problems. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. I became the first parallel supercomputer scientist because I was the first person that performed the world's fastest parallel processed calculations that solved real world problems and because I was the only person to accomplish that alone, as opposed to team research. What is the world's fastest computer? Speed is at the core essence of the supercomputer. The first newspaper article on the supercomputer was dated February 15. 1946 and appeared on page one of the New York Times. That first newspaper article was titled, quote, Electronic Computer Flashes Answers May Speed Engineering, unquote. Airplanes fly at about the same speed they flew in the 1950s. If today's parallel supercomputer speed of a thousand million billion calculations per second was discovered in the 1950s, that decade's supercomputer could compute three million billion times faster. That first supercomputer of 1946 could only perform 385 multiplications per second or 40 divisions per second, or 3 square root calculations per second. That first supercomputer was about 1,000 times faster than the fastest computing aid of the time. 
that supercomputer speed increase from 1946 to present is like an airplane completing a 30,000 year long trip to a distant galaxy in just one day. The car of today has one engine and four tires, just as it had a century ago. By comparison, the fastest supercomputer of today has 10.65 million processors or 10.65 million electronic brains instead of the one electronic brain that it had in mid-1989. The progress achieved in supercomputer technology is akin to completing in one day an intergalactic outer space travel that might have taken 300 centuries if the same trip had started in 1989. Prior to my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July 1989, Parallel processing was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as a beautiful theory that wasn't confirmed with an experiment. Beauty is a subjective term. The discovery of mathematical beauty that has no physical reality is not equivalent to the discovery of a physical phenomenon that can be experimentally reconfirmed. My contribution to the development of the computer was that I experimentally confirmed parallel processing and did so via an experiment that I conducted across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 processors that were identical to each other, that were tightly coupled to each other, and that shared nothing between each other. Metaphorically speaking, my supercomputing choices were to either walk the shortest path called serial processing on only one processor or fly the longest part called parallel processing across millions of processors. Flying was quicker because I can reduce or parallel process 30,000 years to just one day. What is the contribution of Philip M. Aguale to the development of the supercomputer. In 1989, I became an integral part of conversations on contributions to the development of the fastest computers. I became the subject of school reports through my mathematical discovery of how to solve initial boundary value problems arising in mathematical physics and how to solve them across a new internet that is a new global network of processors that we are identical to each other and that we are tightly coupled to each other and that, and that each operated its own operating system. The contribution of Philip Emma Aguale to the development of the supercomputer is this. I was the first person to see the ensemble of processors in a new way, namely as a new internet, in which the processors have a direct relationship with nearest neighboring processors. In the old paradigm of supercomputing, processors were independent entities. I introduced a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about the new computer as a new internet. In my new way or new paradigm, I thought of my new supercomputer as a new internet that was a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. My new internet 
was my instrument of extreme skill computational physics that made the news headlines because I discovered how to harness it and use it as a virtual supercomputer and used it to solve grand challenge initial boundary value problems that the computer cannot solve. My invention, namely my new internet, that is a virtual supercomputer, took a new scientific and technological significance and did both in different contexts. How are supercomputers used? As an extreme scale computational physicist, I used massively parallel supercomputers to execute complicated calculations that would be impossible to execute on the conventional supercomputer. For me, Philip M. Aguale, the parallel supercomputer was my digital thermometer and an instrument that can be used to forecast the temperature rather than tell it. And depending on the grand challenge problem, the required calculations can be the most complicated ever executed. In 1989, I discovered new ways of using the massively parallel supercomputer to solve real-world problems. Fast forward into the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal that highlighted my discovery of parallel processing as the vital technology that will underpin all supercomputers. I discovered how to harness 64 binary thousand processors and harness them to forecast the quote unquote weather at a depth of one mile below the surface of the earth and across an oil field that is the size of a town. If you believe you are weather forecast, then you have to believe that a system of coupled nonlinear time dependent and three dimensional partial differential equations. We are discretized and we are parallel processed across a few billion processors. The Philip M. Aguale formula that then U.S. President Bill Clinton praised during his White House speech of August 26, 2000 was in essence how to mathematically and computationally solve that grand challenge problem and how to solve it across the millions of processors that outline and define a supercomputer that is an internet de facto. The Philip M. Aguale formula is my contribution to the partial differential equation of calculus and physics. The Philip M. Aguale formula opens the new field of massively parallel processed extreme scaled computational fluid dynamics that in turn underpins the fields of weather forecasting, petroleum reservoir simulation, and diverse sub-disciplines. What is the Philip M. Aguali supercomputer? For 30 years, I hardly gave lectures, and that absence promoted an air of mystery surrounding my contributions to the development of the parallel supercomputer. In the 1980s, I abandoned the sequential supercomputer and the vector supercomputer and abandoned both technologies for what is named parallel supercomputing. In my new paradigm of supercomputing, the total processor-to-processor -processor email communications can dominate the total computations. In my new paradigm of supercomputing, the grand challenge problem is fractured into 64 binary thousand problems that in turn allowed a new parallel supercomputer to emerge from the bowels of my assemble 
of processors that defined my new internet that is called the Philip M. Aguali supercomputer. The discovery of parallel supercomputing created the hottest sub-disciplines in mathematics, physics, and computer science. That discovery of parallel supercomputing had rich and fertile consequences across the grand challenge problems of science and engineering. But back in 1943, Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM, said, and I quote, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. End of quote. Back in 1957, the editor in charge of business books for Prentice Hall said, and I quote, I have traveled the length and breadth of this country and talked with the best people. And I can assure you that data processing is a fact that will last out the year. End of quote. Back in the 1970s and 80s, I was mocked and dismissed from my research group. I was rejected because I pursued my research that led to my discovery that a parallel supercomputer will become the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer. The parallel supercomputer is a tool that is used to accelerate innovation and do so because a scientific experiment such as general circulation modeling to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming that would have taken 30,000 years to complete on an, on an ordinary computer can now be parallel processed across an ensemble of millions of processors and take only one day to complete on a supercomputer. Parallel processing is a critical and, and enabling technology that shifted the paradigm in both computing and supercomputing and shifted our way of counting from counting only one thing at a time to counting a million things at once. Parallel processing is a new way of counting. Parallel processing is the cornerstone of drug design that accelerated the discovery of new chemotherapy drugs. New drugs that can kill cancer cells. A new understanding of how Alzheimer's or senile dementia destroys memory. The parallel supercomputer is a tool that makes it possible for a medical doctor to analyze and interpret scans and to detect different disorders and to provide better diagnostic information. The parallel supercomputer is used to accelerate the rate of discovery of new compounds, new materials, new physics, new mathematics, and of course, new computer science. The invention of parallel processing opened a doorway to a new world in supercomputing that is called extreme scale computational physics. That new parallel processed pathway leads to the emerging fields of supercomputing the weather for above and below the surface of the earth. Parallel processing is the vital technology that opened new possibilities that were essential to the development of new sciences, new technologies, and new fields of study. Parallel processing made the impossible to solve possible to solve. Parallel processing widened our horizons and changed the way we looked at the computer and the supercomputer. Parallel processing 
enabled the supercomputer scientists to produce new facts, new mathematics, and, and new physics. The parallel supercomputer brought an enrichment of meanings in the sciences. The parallel supercomputer is the universal enabler of mathematics and science. The first supercomputer that I began programming back on June 20, 1974 was locked away in the bowels of the building at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States. The supercomputer is not used for writing letters or doing taxes or planning a vacation. Since 1957, the supercomputer was programmed by an exclusive priesthood who were versed in a language called Fortran. The term Fortran is the acronym for formula translation. I was one of those supercomputer priests that was at home with Fortran. By the late 1970s and early 80s, I was programming the fastest computers in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, District of Columbia, and in College Park, Maryland. Back from mid-1977 through mid-1980s, the research laboratories that were active in supercomputing and that were a short bus ride from my residences in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of Washington, D.C. and near the Silver Spring Metro Station include the National Security Agency in Fort Meade, Maryland, U.S. Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C., U.S. Aberdeen Proving Ground in Aberdeen, Maryland, David Taylor Model Basin in Bethesda, Maryland, National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gettysburg, Maryland, and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Back then, I was programming the fastest computers and doing so to solve linear systems of equations that arose in extreme scale algebra that in turn arose from my finite difference discretizations of the partial differential equations that I invented and that governed initial boundary value problems of physics and calculus. As a mathematical aside, the differential equation is the most recurring decimal within the grand challenge problems solved in all supercomputers and solved since the first automatic computer was invented in 1946. My discovery of how practical parallel supercomputing can be used to solve grand challenge problems was a breakthrough that was important enough to make the news headlines. That particular discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 opened the door for the modern supercomputer that is powered by millions of processors that is used to cooperatively solve real world problems. That discovery made the news headlines because it enabled us to see computers and supercomputers in a different way, namely as parallel processing or solving a million problems at once instead of solving only one problem at a time. What does the world's fastest supercomputer look like inside? The world's fastest supercomputer occupies the space of a soccer field, but yet its crown jewel 
called parallel processing, has 200 miles of email cables that remains invincible. Back in the 1970s, only a few computer scientists had seen and programmed the most massively parallel supercomputer in the world. Back in the 1980s, I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputer ever built. In 1989, most computer scientists cannot recognize a parallel supercomputer if they see it. I was the first person to recognize that the new global network of identical processors that we are equal distances apart, that we are on the surface of a sphere in three and higher dimensions, was completely different from any supercomputer any programmer had programmed before. In 1989, I was in the news headlines because I recognized the new technology to be a new computer that is a new internet that could be harnessed to solve grand challenge problems and solve them at light speed and used to parallel process massive calculations across millions of commodity of the shelf processors that I integrated into one seamless cohesive supercomputer. What does a supercomputer look like? The world's fastest supercomputer must occupy the space of a soccer field and do so because it is comprised of 10 million processors that we are packed closely together. The supercomputer that I program is 10 million times faster than your computer and is faster because it is powered by an ensemble of 10 million processors that is solving 10 million problems at once. In high performance computing, the quintessential question is this. What makes a computer super At 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I discovered that parallel processing or solving a million problems at once makes the supercomputer super. It's been said that a mathematical truth is not always synonymous to a physical truth. I discovered that parallel supercomputing is a mathematical truth that is synonymous to a physical truth. In the 1970s and 80s, I was the lone wolf parallel processing programmer and the first supercomputer scientist to recognize that the parallel supercomputer could be harnessed and used to solve extreme scale problems arising in computational physics. I was the first person to figure out how to use the parallel supercomputer to solve real world problems. I am the first programmer of the modern supercomputer that solves grand challenge problems and did so by dividing them into millions of smaller problems and solving them simultaneously or in parallel and solving them with a one-to-one -one problem to processor correspondence and solving them across as many processors. In summary, my signature invention was my discovery that parallel processing is the vital technology that underpins every supercomputer and that helps solve unsolved real-world problems. What makes a computer super? China spent $300 million 
to build one parallel supercomputer. Japan has a parallel supercomputer on the drawing board that will cost $1.25 billion. A computer that costs a billion dollars is a supercomputer. The parallel supercomputer was not invented in its entirety in only one day. The modern supercomputer began in an Eureka moment, namely my discovery that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989. On that date, I discovered that parallel processed time to solutions is 16 orders of magnitude faster than its serial processed counterpart. My discovery inspired the adoption of parallel processing as the standard technology that powers all supercomputers manufactured. But most importantly, a supercomputer isn't super until it is used to forecast the weather for your evening news or used to handcast the weather within the crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that is flowing one mile underneath the surface of a production oil field that is the size of a town. That handcast or parallel processed petroleum reservoir simulation was simulated at the fastest speeds in supercomputing. Back on the 4th of July, 1989, I was the lone wolf full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputer ever built, and that was parallel processing across a new internet that was a new global network of two raised to power 16 processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that were equal distances apart from each other, that were identical to each other, and that shared nothing between each other. The central processing unit or processor is the brain of the computer and my supercomputer was powered by 65,536 brains or as many processors that each operated its own operating system. Why must the research scientist use the supercomputer? The answer is that some of nature's secrets are discoverable only by parallel processing and doing so within the fastest supercomputers. The weather and the climate are intimately related. The climate is the weather averaged over a century. We get the weather, but we expect the climate. The predictive accuracy of climate models increases when the number of processors used to predict the climate increases. The parallel supercomputer is in the hands of the weather forecaster in the United States. The supercomputer is in the hands of the extreme scale petroleum reservoir simulator in the Niger Delta oil fields of the southeastern region of Nigeria that is seeking to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas that was buried for one million years and buried one mile below the surface of an oil field that is the size of a town. In extreme scale computational medicine, the technology of the massively parallel supercomputer is the bedrock of the technique of massively parallel sequencing that yields high throughput, throughput in DNA sequencing. Back in 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered what makes the world's fastest supercomputer fast. I discovered that parallel processing is the vital technology that puts the super into the supercomputer. 
and Philip Emagwale. The history of civilization is the history of technology. Fire is man's first invention, or rather, man's first discovery. Who domesticated the first chicken? Who domesticated the first goat? Who rode the first horse? The names of ancient scientific pioneers are lost in the midst of time. Who solved the first quadratic equation? Who programmed the first ensemble of processors that led to the invention of the modern supercomputer that computes in parallel? The computer is the quintessential human invention. The supercomputer is the intellectual workhorse of mathematics and of mathematicians and physicists. Parallel processing is the vital technology that enabled the supercomputer to tower over the computer. Fast computation is what defines the computer. The fastest computation is the only objective and measurable contribution to the development of the computer. Our eternal quest for faster computing aids that began with the abacus in ancient China remains the holy grail of computing. Yet, that quest had only one paradigm shift of a tectonic scale, namely parallel processing or computing many things at once, instead of computing only one thing at a time. Parallel processing is the enabling technological knowledge that makes modern computers faster as well as makes the new supercomputer the fastest. Searching for the parallel processed solution to the toughest problem arising in calculus and physics was like searching for a black goat at night. My journey to the farthest frontier of technological knowledge and my quest for the fastest supercomputer that is a new internet was a mathematical journey from fiction to fact to fact to forecast. The fastest supercomputer is where humanity's future takes shape. I'm Philip Emagwale. In my family, I traveled the farthest when I left Asaba, Nigeria, for the bus station in Onicha, Nigeria, on early Saturday morning of March 23, 1974. At nine o'clock that morning, I boarded the red and white painted luxury bus called Midwest Line and traveled for nearly 48 hours from Onicha to Benin City. At Benin City, I became impatient that the Midwest Line bus was too slow at merely 60 miles per hour. I was afraid that I might miss my flight to the United States. For that reason, I transferred to a four-door Mercedes-Benz car, a taxi that was also operated by the Midwest Line. That was the most dangerous car ride of my life. The taxi driver floored the pedal to speeds of nearly 120 miles per hour. The taxi driver was speeding because he wanted to get to Lagos as fast as possible to attend an afternoon soccer match. At about 2.30 in the afternoon, I was in Lagos Motor Park from where I took a taxi to Ikeja Airport of Lagos, Nigeria. At about 5 o'clock, I boarded a Pan-American aircraft that originated from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia to New, York's, to, to, to New York City, Chicago, 
and Portland, Oregon, United States, with stopovers in Monrovia, Liberia, and Dakar, Senegal. My longest journey was not from Nigeria to the United States, but was from the conventional supercomputer at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, to the massively parallel supercomputer in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. That journey was to the frontier of human knowledge that was at the crossroad of mathematics, physics, and computer science. I grew in scientific knowledge over the 16 years onward of March 25, 1974, that I studied mathematical physics and conducted supercomputer research and did both across six institutions and across as many national laboratories in the United States. As also expected, my parallel processing theories and companion experiments on what puts the super into the supercomputer grew and evolved over my first 16 years of research in the United States. In 1974, in Oregon, United States, I read a science fiction story that was published half a century earlier and dated February 1, 1922, to be exact. The science fiction was about 64,000 human computers working together to solve the partial differential equations that must be solved as the precondition to forecasting the weather for the Earth. After reading that science fiction story back in 1974, my quest became to figure out how to turn that science fiction to non-fiction. Back in the 1980s, my parallel processing experiment was like a warfare that I carried across a new internet that is a new global network of processors. I felt like I carried that warfare against 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists that mocked me and made fun of me and that dismissed my massively parallel supercomputer research as a blue sky project. Back in the 1980s, my research in massively parallel supercomputing was very advanced and too complicated and was impossible for anyone other than myself to understand. The reason was that it took me 16 years to understand how to parallel process and solve a grand challenge initial boundary value problem. For that reason, it would also take my readers 16 years to understand my original 1057 page research report. That body of knowledge at the frontiers of mathematics, physics, and computer science was not graspable within a few days. That body of knowledge on how to parallel process across millions of processors must also detain the reader for 16 years. I was asked to name who taught me how to harness the power of a new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 processors. By definition, the inventor was not taught the invention that he or she invented. As the inventor of practical parallel supercomputing, the community of 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists learned parallel supercomputing from me, just like I learned vector supercomputing from them. Back in the 1980s, I was teaching them practical parallel supercomputing instead of them teaching me vector supercomputing. To say that Philip Emma Aguale, 
the inventor was taught practical parallel supercomputing. It's like saying that a boy gave birth to himself and then created his own father. By the definition of invention, the inventor cannot learn what will make the next fastest computer fastest. By its definition, the world record fastest supercomputer can only be invented, not learned. Back in the 1970s, Jurai's parallel processing was attacked and ridiculed as a huge waste of everybody's time. The parallel supercomputer was mocked by Seymour Cray, the supercomputer designer that designed seven intense supercomputers of the 1980s. Massively parallel supercomputing across billions upon millions of processors represents the peak of supercomputer knowledge and demands an impeccable understanding of physics, algebra, and calculus. My primary goal when parallel processing across processors that define and outline an internet is to hit targets that we are invincible to other supercomputer scientists and do so by maintaining a one problem to one processor mapping. That mapping in turn is a precondition to actualizing the world's fastest computer. In the 1970s and 80s, my grand challenge was to figure out how to massively parallel process and to prove that the new knowledge of how to solve problems in parallel will become the vital technology that will underpin future computers and supercomputers. I was only interested in making the weightiest discovery that will upgrade parallel processing from science fiction to reality. It took me 16 years, onward of June 20, 1974, in Covalis, Oregon, United States, to discover practical parallel supercomputing. After those 16 years, the prize committee for the top prize in supercomputing invited me to San Francisco, California, for its annual, for its award ceremony, and gave me the platform to present my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing and present it to the world at large and present it to the community of 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists that, that ridiculed and mocked parallel supercomputing as a beautiful theory that lacked and experimental confirmation. Over the years, the finalists for the top prize in the field of supercomputing consisted of teams of up to 50 seasoned supercomputer scientists. I stood out because I was the only person that won that top prize and won it alone for my contributions to the development of the parallel supercomputer. If supercomputer scientists were ranked like the military, the inventor of the parallel supercomputer will be elevated to the rank of field marshal of the British Army or to the rank of five-star general of the US Army. Those are the highest ranks in the Army that few, if any, are appointed to. Today, parallel supercomputing has become distilled and deciphered as a new contribution to a new computer science. The year 1989 was when the supercomputer industry understood and began to harness that new knowledge of massively parallel supercomputing and incorporate it 
as the vital technology that underpins every supercomputer. Back in the 1980s, the parallel supercomputer was like a giant ocean wave that many supercomputer scientists were still riding, with most barely clinging onto the then radical technology and with some falling off it. Back in the 1980s, many supercomputer scientists mocked my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing and made fun of me. Today, parallel processing is the vital technology that underpins every supercomputer that is used by those supercomputer scientists that mocked me and made fun of me. The parallel supercomputer of the 1980s was the most complex computing machinery in the world. That was the reason the community of 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists avoided programming the parallel supercomputer because it was too difficult to program an ensemble of 65,000 536 processors. I was the sole programmer of 16 massively parallel supercomputers of the 1980s. I was the only supercomputer scientist in the world that had the confidence and possessed the command of materials that was needed to parallel process across an ensemble of 64 binary thousand tightly coupled processors that shared nothing between each other. In the 1980s, I was the only supercomputer scientist in the world that had both the scientific and technological knowledge that was needed to deliver extensive public lectures on the parallel supercomputer. My extensive videotaped lectures on supercomputing can be watched on youtube.com slash emmaagwale. I was at the ground zero of supercomputing. And that is the reason Philip Emmaagwale is the subject of school reports on inventors. Parallel processing is the greatest achievement in the world of supercomputers that resulted in the groundbreaking discovery that redefined the frontiers of knowledge in mathematics, physics, and computer science. I discovered parallel processing because my starting point was from first principles or the laws of physics. That's where I invented both new partial differential equations of calculus and their companion new partial difference equations of algebra. I was also the research code physicist that parallel processed 64 binary thousand computer codes and did so across a new internet that is a new global network of tightly coupled processors that were identical to each other and that encircled a globe and did so in the manner the internet encircled the earth. If I had followed the advice of Jean Amdahl or Seymour Cray, I would not have discovered that practical parallel processing will become the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer of today. I invented practical parallel processing and I did so at a time the supercomputer textbook said that it will forever remain impossible or at least impractical. The forthcoming fusion of massively parallel processing with artificial intelligence will give birth to a new breed of fastest and smartest supercomputers. Such supercomputers can learn and detect and connect the dots amongst the important features in large data sets of seemingly unrelated facts. Such supercomputers 
can process and understand the realms of data and process them to discover new knowledge that would otherwise remain elusive. Today, robots are learning to think like humans. With supercomputing, humans will learn to think like robots, not vice versa. The supercomputer is used to increase productivity. Parallel processing inexorably exchanged the supercomputer and the technology is here to stay. I choose to parallel process in the 1970s and 80s and at a time it was forbidden by Amdahl's law as described in supercomputer textbooks that were published onwards of April 1967. My experiment of the 4th of July 1989 that I conducted across my ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors made the news headlines because it revealed never before recorded supercomputer speeds that I recorded by parallel processing across processors. I discovered that initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics that are impossible to solve on only one processor are possible to solve across millions upon millions of commodity of the shelf processors that we are within a massively parallel supercomputer. My discovery of practical parallel processing that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States changed the way we look at the computer and opened the door to further experiments on new computers that might be beyond the parallel supercomputer. Faster supercomputers contribute to the expansion of human knowledge. The reason I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputers of the 1980s was that the technology was mocked, abandoned as a dead-end road. Seymour Cray, the leader in the computing field of vector processing, vehemently argued that it would be a huge waste of everybody's time to pursue parallel processing. Seymour Cray and Gene Amdahl each believed that he would be dead before parallel processing becomes the technology that powers all supercomputers. On the contrary, Seymour Cray and Gene Amdahl both lived to see parallel processing become the crown jewel inside every supercomputer. My parallel processed solution of the grand challenge problem of supercomputing proved that both Seymour Cray and Jean Amdahl were wrong when they asserted that parallel processing is a waste of time. Back in the 1970s and 80s, the parallel process was to cross the border between the known vector supercomputer and the unknown ens ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors that was a supercomputer hopeful. The upper limit of my quest for the fastest computation was my parallel processed supercomputing in the 64th mathematical dimension in which two raised to power 64 processors that were identical to each other had a one-to-one -one correspondence with the vertices of the cube in the 64th dimensional hyperspace. That upper limit in parallel processing will remain in the realm of science fiction. The word computer had different meanings to each generation. To most people, the laptop is the computer. Back in the 1980s, the desktop was the computer. However, one thing that has not changed 
is the definition of the computer as a machinery that at its core executes fast calculations. The supercomputer is any one of the 1,000 fastest computers in the world. I'm often asked, what makes a supercomputer super? For me, the new supercomputer that I invented was a new global network of processors that had no central pro control processor. The new supercomputer that I invented is a new internet because it executes its calculations across a new global network of processors. The fastest parallel processed computations and communications could only be experimentally discovered on the cost between the dream, the dream between the dream planetary sized supercomputer and tomorrow's science fiction internet. I was the subject of school reports because I discovered how to evenly divide real world grand challenge problems and discovered how to map those real world problems and how to distribute them with a one problem to one processor correspondence and how to simultaneously solve those problems across millions upon millions of commodity processors that were identical to each other and that shared nothing between each other. I emailed each smaller problem as a digital code of zeros and ones. I divided each grand challenge problem according to a set of rules. I gave each emailed code a header that described which processor the code is from. That header also described which processor should receive the code and where the code belongs in the grand challenge problem that is an ensemble of millions of smaller computational physics problems that each is an initial boundary value problem that is governed by my system of partial differential equations of calculus. The new mathematical knowledge that I just described is the mathematical essence of the Philip Emma Aguale formula for the world's fastest computer that then US President Bill Clinton described in his White House speech of August 26, 2000 that made the news headlines. That new knowledge called practical parallel processing that I discovered on the 4th of July 1989 was what made the supercomputer super. The United States Constitution is amended occasionally to bring it up to 21st century reality. My supercomputer lectures must be similarly amended to bring them up to date. In particular, I had to enlarge what it means to smooth out the jagged frontiers of scientific knowledge and to contribute in the technological context of 21st century computer science. The quest for human progress is a journey to the future and to the terra incognita, where the scientific discovery is the magical act of showing that sometimes that believed to be impossible is in fact possible. To invent or see something that was previously unseen is to create the future. It's like doing something no human had done before or like traveling to a planet no human had visited before. I define the supercomputer as any computer that is listed within the top 1,000 fastest computers in the world. By my definition, the few computers of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s were supercomputers. 
And the computers that I programmed in the 1970s and 80s were supercomputers. Retrospectively, and as a sub-Saharan African-born scientist in the United States who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, my scientific career took a path that some thought it should not have taken. Back in 1989, many people struggled to understand why a black man was the sole full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputer ever built. The answer, in part, is that I started programming the CDC 3300, one of the world's fastest supercomputers back on June 20, 1974, at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. I remember that date as 18 days before President Richard Nixon was forced out of the White House. The maximum of 80 computer programmers at a time and from the entire state of Oregon indicated that there were only a few hundred computer programmers in Oregon in 1974. Back in the 1980s and within the nuclear research laboratories in the United States where active supercomputing research is conducted, I was treated like a security threat. I was de facto an illegal alien who sought refuge at the frontier of supercomputing knowledge. For the record, my earlier supercomputer accounts were revoked whenever it was discovered that I was black and sub-Saharan African. Because my supercomputer accounts were revoked, my survival strategy was to stay low-key and, and do so during my first 16 years as a supercomputer scientist. As a black and African research supercomputer scientist in Corvallis, Oregon, my quintessential question was this. What did my isolating identity do to me as a research scientist? In Corvallis, Oregon, I lived a very isolating identity and I grappled with existential issues. After 16 years of unrecognized supercomputer research, I began to wonder if one day my contributions will be forgotten. Being the first person to be referred to as a supercomputer scientist confused a lot of people and did so in part because I was black and African. As a black parallel supercomputer scientist, I was mocked and made fun of because I worked alone and tried to turn this science fiction of parallel processing into the non-fiction that is today's supercomputer. Back in 1974, Kida Hall, the symbol of mathematics in Corvallis, Oregon, United States, was a seemingly majestic structure. So were the physics and the engineering buildings. Back in 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, the computer science department was hinged in a hastily put together trailer. In 1974, I didn't see a future in the field of computer science because it lacked the respectability to be housed in a multi-story concrete building. In May and June 1974, I lived at 15 Edgewood, Edgewood Way. Corvallis, Oregon, United States. That was the residence of Ted and Connie Falk. Folk. Ted was a chemical engineer that retrained as a physician, and Connie was a high school teacher. From March 1975 
through June 1977, I parked my red two-speed bicycle at the back of Kida Hall at 2000 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon. That was 190 feet from the supercomputer that I was programming. That was the world's fastest computer when it was manufactured back in December 1965. From October 1975 through January 1976, I lived at 2540 Southwest Whiteside Drive, Covalis, Oregon, United States. That was the residence of Fred and Anne Merrifield. Fred was a noted civil engineer who co-founded a global engineering company called CH2M. I rode my red two-speed bicycle that I bought for $10 to 2000 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, a distance of 2.6 miles, where I used the teletype to assess and program the first supercomputer to be rated at 1 million instructions per second, and that was 190 feet away and across the street. The essence of my existence is abstract mathematics that is impenetrable to most research scientists. And solving grand challenge initial boundary value, mathematical problems, and solving them by massively parallel supercomputing their algebraic approximations was also impenetrable to the most able research mathematicians. Back in 1941, the largest system of equations of algebra that could be solved involved only 29 unknowns. The ENIAC and UNIVAC supercomputers came along in 1946 and 51, respectively. The CDC 3300 supercomputer that I programmed in Covalis, Oregon, was introduced in, 19, in December 1965, and in that year, it was the fastest computer in the world, or the number one ranked supercomputer. The CDC 3300 supercomputer was used to forecast the weather. The theorized parallel supercomputing that I invented in my head back in the 1970s was different from the practical parallel supercomputing that I invented later in the 1980s. Through two decades of trial and error, I learned that I could only invent the parallel supercomputer that could be invented, or rather the fastest supercomputer that the laws of physics permit me to invent. Prior to the 4th of July 1989, the parallel supercomputer was a technology that I knew but cannot explain or confirm by an experiment. I was the first person to be referred to as a supercomputer scientist. Supercomputing is a broad field. I am a supercomputer scientist that placed his emphasis on the science. Some supercomputer scientists are mathematicians who prove which abstract supercomputer can or cannot solve a grand challenge problem. Some supercomputer scientists are engineers who build supercomputers. Some supercomputer scientists are inventors who measure the speed of never before seen supercomputers and tries to invent the fastest supercomputer that is powered by new technologies. I was trained as a research mathematician, research engineer, and research physicist. I conducted my supercomputing research at the frontiers and at the crossroad where mathematics, physics, and computing met. 
In the 1980s, the United States Department of Energy compiled a list of 20 impossible to solve problems that were very important. Those 20 problems were thereafter dubbed the 20 grand challenges of supercomputing. Those 20 grand challenge problems we are to computing for the seven millennium problems we are to mathematics. The reason the grand challenge problems that pertain to physics were exceptionally difficult was that each problem can only be solved by a polymath who has command and mastery of physics, algebra, calculus, and computer science. My parallel processed solution of the grand challenge problem was highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal and was described as cover stories of top mathematical publications. My complete solution was described in my very lengthy series of online lectures. Only a polymath will have the confidence to tackle the grand challenge problem. Back in the 1970s and 80s, extreme-scale computational mathematicians didn't deem the parallel processing of initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics as merely difficult. Mathematicians deemed the parallel processing of real-world grand challenge problems as impossible. For that reason, it was then said that parallel processing was a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. My contribution to the development of the computer, of the supercomputer, is this. I provided that lockdown experimental confirmation of parallel supercomputing, and I made that discovery at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. I remember that date because it was the U.S. Independence Day. I discovered practical supercomputing, and I discovered the supercomputer technology across my ensemble of 65,536 processors that was the precursor to the current world record of 10.65 million processors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm finished, Emma Agali. Insightful and brilliant lecture. Insightful and brilliant lecture.